Good morning to you. A very happy Easter to be coming. This is one of the greatest days in commemoration of the resurrection of our Lord. It's one of the greatest days of all the world's history. It's the resurrection. Amen. And we're so happy to be here this morning on this great day and to see the sun rising and the flowers arising from the earth. Everything speaks of Easter. And now let us bow our heads just one moment. Father God, into thy presence we come. And we are expecting thee to give to us this morning just a little extra blessing from heaven. Some little touch of the Easter in our own souls. That when we leave here, we might say as those who came from him there, did not our hearts burn within us because of his presence. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Over in the last book, the 28th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, and the 7th verse, I wish to read for a text as we go into this service. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. There has been many great commissions given to man. And the peoples of this earth. But never was there such an important commission given as this one. Go tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. <coughs> That's a great commission. And the only way this could be given was because there had to be a great conquering first. There has been man in our days and in the days gone by and the great history of this world and its great broad fields of battle there has been many great conquerors. Many great things has been done for the human race. For instance, I am thinking as I come down this morning, waking up early and did not have chance to study very much because I didn't know just what part last night we would have today between the pastor and I in the services. <coughs> But on my road down, I happened to think what this morning would be the best that I know to say to his people to take a message. I thought of this. Go tell his disciples. Now, his disciples is his followers. A disciple is one who follows. And I thought of this subject of the great and mighty conqueror. And... Thinking of how many great conquerors we have had in this world and what great things they have done to further and better the human way of living, I was thinking of the great Napoleon back in his days, how he was not exactly a Frenchman, but he had something in his mind. First, he, he despised France. He did not like it. He come from the Isles. But he had an idea in his mind that someday that he would conquer. And the reason that he had these in his mind, he had to have something to work on. To every man, before you can do a job, you have to have some uh, a motive some uh, alternative, something that you're working on for a working purpose, something to work by. And as we all know, but taking the history of Hitler, or not of Hitler, but of, of Napoleon, that he went by the moon and by the changing of the stars. He worked that way. And expecting, because at one time he did so, and he won a victory. 
And he come over into France. And he become a great warrior. He put many men to death because that they wouldn't agree with him. And he cleaned his entire country of anything that was against him. He just absolutely wiped it out. Because he had to have it that way. If he didn't have it that way, there would be something against him all the time. And his great plan that he had in his mind, his own life would be at stake. So he had to have his entire kingdom just as perfect as he could get it. I'm thinking now that you're following me in this of the great conqueror that I'm thinking. Everything in his kingdom must be for him. It must be heart, soul, and body for him. There can be nothing against him. Anything that was against him, he'd have to dismiss it. He must have absolutely everything for him. And when Napoleon, he took up arms, cannons, guns, muskets, swords, and he went forth with this one thought, that he would conquer the world. And he practically did that at the age of 33. When he was a young man, he was a prohibitionist. And his great fame made him so self-styled and it got upon his nerves until he died at the age of 33, an alcoholic. His popularity he could not stand. And I think of a man who at, this, at the age of 33 conquered the world and died an alcoholic because of his fame and lost the very principle that he was fighting for. He was the, he was kind of a type, or not a type, I would say, but he was the devil's instrument and in trying to fight the world down. And he failed at 33. But oh, this great mighty warrior that I'm speaking of, at the age of 33, conquered everything that was in earth and in, in hell at the age of 33. Wow. A great and mighty conqueror. I'm thinking of the great battles that's been fought on the field. We know to finish up with Napoleon that he come to his end at Waterloo. It was my privilege not long ago to view over the imitations made of the ruins of his chariots and of the horsemen and of the man of how they laid on the battlefield and the chariots piled together the wheels broken right uh, and out into the plains of where this great display is made and what a contrast it is to notice that man at 33 and the disgrace that is laying there in him, the memorial of his great battle and conquering, and then to go to Jerusalem and look at an empty tomb as a memorial of the great and mighty conqueror. Somehow or another, there's something in conquering. If we have something that we're fighting for, if there is a disease in our body and we're fighting between death and life, what a victory it is when we see it's conquered. If we're fighting over some great habit or some great something that's besetting us, when finally the great flags wave and we have conquered it, what a feeling it gives us inside us Amen. for we can then be a conqueror. And I'm thinking of the last war and how that when Hitler had taken Warsaw and the Germans thought that that was one of the greatest victories that could be because of their great chief captain Adolf Hitler had at once sunk 
everything in Warsaw tore down the bridges and the great bridge fell. The papers packed great pictures of the falling of the bridge. The Germans marched through the street and they beat drums and they blowed whistles and the thousands of airplanes passed by him as he won his first great victory, setting out like an Alexander the Great or Napoleon to conquer the world. But where did he wind up? In disgrace. Certainly he did. I can remember when they built the great Burma Pass. There must be, if they crossed over the mountain, some of the boys are sitting here this morning perhaps that crossed over this great pass. What a task it was. How much real work it taken. And what a real job they did. And how much money it cost to build that Burma Pass. The millions of dollars. The boys that lost their lives in doing so. But finally and after a while, when the last mile of the way had been gone, and when the pass was completed, that how the victorious shouts went up from the people. They had a pass that they could cross the mountains with to win the victory. I'm thinking of another pass that one day it cost the life of our blessed Lord. It was not only a road on the earth, but it was a highway Amen. called the Highway of Holiness Amen. where the unclean shall not pass through, but only those who are branded, only those who are on the side that He is on shall pass this highway. Amen. Great victories has been won. Many of us today can remember well of the First World War. I remember when I was just a little boy, I could hear the whistles blowing, and even the farmers in the field stopped their horses and waved their hats. They screamed, they hollered. What had happened? The war was over. Victory was won. The great economy that we were fighting for, finally we had won the victory. I'm thinking of this last world's war. I lived just across the street. And when the whistles begin to blow, people run into the yards, women with their aprons on, taking them off and swinging them in the air. Bullets flew through the trees, whistles blowed, cars raced through the streets. People fell on their knees and raised up their hands. They screamed, they cried, ha, ah, because the war was over. And the blessed ones, the dear boys that was across the sea would soon be sailing home again to them. What a victory. What a time. And it's a thrill to any heart. What a jubilee. That night everybody was in such a humor. You could have walked into the restaurant and eaten, walked out, not paid for it. It would have been all right. You could have used the next man's car. It would have been all right. You could have asked what you wanted to. You would have probably got it. Because why? The victory was won. Amen. The boys were coming home. It was all over. And I'm thinking, my brother, it's too bad that those kind of feelings can't stay all the time. But to the Christian this morning, the victory is won. Amen. The joy bells are ringing. The war's over between God and man. The victory's been won. 
Before any victory can be won, there must be great prices paid. Oh, what prices! And sometimes they are very deep. And they make great scars. Tearing down. But in order to have the mountain, we've got to have the valley. Before we can have the sunshine, we've got to get the rain. Before we can have the light, we've got to get the night. Before we can have right, they had to have wrong, or you'd have never known what wrong was. But in order to conquer and to win the greatest battle that was every one, one step out of glory many years ago, and he did not take upon himself the form of an angel. He did not come as some great person. But he was going to prove that it don't take muskets and bullets and atomic bombs to win a war. He clothed himself in humility like a little baby and was born in a manger. There was not even a place for his birth when he come home. I want you to look at the different material of warfare, what he used. Now Adam's race was all in bondage. There they were without hope, without God, without chance, without mercy, without anything that could help them. The great enemies of the lower regions of the lost had them shut up in darkness. There was not a way out. There was no one could help. Nothing could be done. It looked like a total, complete loss. But our hero, who came down from the portals of glory, condensing down, for there was no man on earth could do the job. They were all, as worldly speaking, in the same boat. We were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. And none of us could help each other. We stood helpless, defeated. Chaos on every hand. All ununited. We could not keep laws and ceremonies. Finding their weaknesses and so forth, we could not do it. And it seemed like the whole human race was laid waste. And then he came. He came down because he was in the beginning the Bible said he was the Word. He was the Logos that went out of God. And the Logos in the beginning was the Word. And he became the Word. Then when he ascended up on that glorious day of Easter, he became not only the Word, but he became the high priest of his own Word. Oh, what a glorious thing, Brother Neville. Amen. To think he's not only the Word, but he's the high priest of Amen. his own Word. Amen. Amen. How could we doubt it? How could we walk to him and not believe that we receive what we ask for? For he is the Word and the intercessor of the Word. The Logos became Word, and the Word made flesh, and the same flesh that was the Word received up into glory, and now is the high priest making intercession by himself to his Word. Praise the Lord. That's what it takes. That's the material that the church has got. 
What a weapon! There's never been one like it. He was the Word. And when He come, He was born in a manger. He come to use the weapon of L-O-V-E, love. To conquer the world, not with army bullets, not with machine guns and tanks, but He come in a different manner. He come in the form of love. He was God's love. One time as a little boy, I used to think that Christ loved me and God hated me because that Christ died for me, but God had something against me. But I come to find out that Christ is the very heart of God. Amen. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but would have eternal life. Now He come first to conquer and the thing that the devil had put in the world was hatred. And He come to conquer hatred. When we win our battles and so forth in the world's battles, it's always leaves continually a hatred. Because battles of that sort is of the enemy. But Christ come with love to conquer hatred, to love those who were unlovable. He come with a different weapon and he humbled himself made a little lower than the angels to suffer death and to give an example. And when he was here on earth, he walked among man. He proved his weapons of warfare. When he healed the sick, when he took five little biscuits and two pieces of fishes and fed 5,000 people, he proved that he had the power over every atomic that there was. Amen. Not only did he grow fish, but he grew cooked fish. Amen. Not only did he grow wheat in those biscuits, but he grew cooked wheat in those biscuits. Amen. It showed that he was that great and mighty conqueror. Amen. Not only did he get the water from the well, but he made that water wine from the well. He proved he had power to conquer. And he loved. And his weapon was love. Now notice, then when he did that, when he stood one day by the side of Lazarus' grave, and there was a man dead and buried for four days. Even the ones that was by said, even now he stinketh. His nose had fell in. The skin worms has crawled through him. And Jesus stood there as the mighty conqueror. When he said to Martha and Mary, when he stood there, did not I say unto you, if thou could only believe, you would see the glory of God. He had just got through saying when they said, Our brother's dead and so forth. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Have I not just told you that that eternal blessed power lays within me? He never only made a statement. He was able to carry out everything that he said. For he was the mighty conqueror. Dwelling in him, holding back. Fail with human flesh as a man, but inside of there dwelt none other but Almighty God, the great and mighty one. He could recreate, he could create new things, 
he could speak and what he asked for would be given at that second. But he humbled himself. He kept low. He wanted to give an example. He wanted to be the right kind of a conqueror. And he was. Now, he proved himself to be. As I've often said in my meetings, may it would bear witness this morning. In this group of people on this beautiful Easter morning, a lady belonging to a certain church that doesn't believe in accepting the blood of the Lord Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. She told me that the man was just a prophet, a wonderful man, and I get made him deity. I said, he was deity. He was God. She said, you try to make him too great. I said, there is no words can express his greatness. Human tongue has never found the expression. Speaking with the man the other day, a diplomat from Washington, D.C., and he said at a little testimony at a, a breakfast where we were associated together, he said, Brother Branham, I've been a Lutheran all my life. But he said the other day while panning an old-fashioned revival, said, I knelt down at an altar and wanted to get an experience with God. He said, and while I was there on my knees, now this is a Washington diplomat that even served under President Coolidge. And when he looked up, he said, I saw a vision of Jesus. Man. He said, I am able to speak nine different languages fluently. He said, but I couldn't find one word to say of all those nine languages. He said, so I just raised up my hand and he gave me a new one to talk with. He said, I just seen the glory of his face. Amen. This lady says to me, she said, Brother Branham, Jesus was not nothing but a man, just a prophet. I said, he was God, my sister. She said, you make him deity, but he's not. So she said, on the road down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said he wept. Sure, he was the very heart of God. He suffered like we suffer. He was flesh like we are flesh. He bore in his body the same desires and things that we do. Yet to become a perfect sacrifice, he had to do that. He did. But I said, she said he wept going down to the grave of Lazarus. I said, but old lady, that's right. He was a man when he was weeping. But when he stood there by the side of that grave where the silent dead laid, where a rotten body laid covered up with a napkin, when he said, take away the stone, he pulled his little frame together and said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man that had been dead four days stood on his feet. What was it? Corruption knew its maker. The soul knew its master. And that great and mighty conqueror proved there that he has the power of death and hell in the grave. Sure it thrills our heart. You're talking about beating dishpans and blowing horns. The world ought to be in a jubilee this morning like it never has been. The screams and shouts of his people. Because this is the memorial day that when he conquered the last enemy and set we captives free. Yes, he was a man, that's right. He proved to be a man and he proved to be God. One night when the great raging sea who's called thousands of lives. Maybe some of you mothers here this morning, your boys died on the raging sea out down there. They may have sunk beneath the waves in this world broad fields of battle. Some of your loved ones lays out there maybe beneath the sea. But one night when he was laying in a little boat and the waves was a bouncing around on the sea like a bottle stopper. 
He raised and put his foot upon the rail of the boat. He looked up towards heaven and said, Peace. And to the waves he said, Be still. And that mighty sea smoothed out till there wasn't a wrinkle on it. Certainly he was. It's true that he hungered like a man. When he come down off the mountain and he was hungry looking over a tree for something to eat, he was a man. But when he took those five biscuits and a few fish and fed 5,000, he was more than a man. When he died 1,900 years ago, day before yesterday, hanging on a cross, screaming for mercy, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He died like a man. But 1,900 and something years ago this morning, he proved what he was. He gave the last seal of his Messiahship when he broke the bands of death and hell asunder and raised from the grave. Triumph! I'm alive forevermore. And because I live, you live also. There's a conqueror. You talk about jerking off aprons and waving it. People say we're crazy because we shout and we run and we scream and we holler. They have never felt the victorious vibrations of heaven that the battle is over. Our great mighty conqueror has won every victory. He stands alone this morning untouched when he come to earth, they give him the lowest name they could give him. As a fanatic, they call him Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Try. He went to the lowest city there is in the earth, Jericho. And the littlest man in the city had to look down to see him. But when God, 1900 years ago, raised him up. Amen. That's what man done to him. But with the weapon of love, he conquered every devil. And God raised him so high and gave him a name above every name. There's names in heaven and earth. Every name in heaven bows to the name of Jesus. Every angel, every monarch, everything bows to the name of Jesus. Every tongue shall confess him. Every knee shall bow to him. And he is ex- descended so high above to even he has to look down to see the heavens. Man, the Lord. That's the mighty conqueror. That's the one who did it. When he left the earth after last night we had, he had the keys of death and hell hanging on his side. Amen. Fear not. I am he that was dead and is alive again forevermore. And, and the conjunction, I have the keys of death and hell hanging right here. Talk about a conqueror. And because I conquered, I only made a highway for you to travel. Man was refused from heaven. The highways was closed. There was no highways. But where there was no highways, he come to make one. Oh my. The first rhyme was demons of doubt. The next was prejudice. The next was selfishness. This earth was covered over lines of demon power. Then sickness, diseases. But when he began to ascend up to heaven. Last night we had him coming out of hell with the keys of death and hell on his side. This morning we're taking him up. Hallelujah. When he rose, he had, he was triumphant. And as he went up, he broke every devil power that holds over man. Amen. He ascended on high and give gifts to man. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The mighty conqueror. He stands alone this morning. And between him and every believer is a blessed old highway of holiness that the righteous shall walk on. 
There's not a way of escape. There's only one line cut down from glory. He left the bloody footprint as he walked to the quarters of the demon powers and made a highway for us all the way through. Sets on high this morning as the mighty conqueror. His people are having a jubilee. Tens of thousands of them around the world are shouting a victory. I have watched this old cold farm or church joining. I can imagine someone saying, I'll show you the discard of it. Here, as soon as the first war was over, my message is coming down the road here, coming to a Greyhound bus. They said, what's all the noise? What's it all about? And one of them said, looky here, here's the paper. The war has just ceased. And everybody crying and shouting. But one woman said, oh my, why did it have to end like that? Said if it could just have lasted a few days longer. Said John and I have been sitting on easy street. Said we have been sitting. There was a man standing in the back of the villa. The bus got that woman and almost thrown her through the door. And when the police arrested the man, he said the reason I do it. He said that woman had no body over there. She was concerned about her. But I've got two boys over there. He said, I couldn't hold my emotions. Amen. Oh, brother, I've got a father over yonder. i got loved ones over yonder. It's something to me. When Jesus conquered, i got a wife, i got a baby, i got loved ones. Amen. That great, mighty conqueror, you can call me holy roller, religious fanatic, whatever you want to, but when I think of that great war is settled, the price is paid, the victory won, Jesus rose from the dead, the final seal of his messiahship, that is all over. He's alive this morning with the keys of death and hell. Amen. I got loved ones across the bar yonder. I'm on this grand old highway walking up to see him. Don't think I'm crazy. Oh, but I'm so happy. It's all settled. It's a finished work. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming. Oh, glorious day. This blessed old baptism of the Holy Spirit to guide us up this marvelous old highway. Oh, how glorious it is. How could I ever be ashamed of it? I stand with St. Paul this morning saying this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power Amen. of God in the salvation. It's the power over sickness. It's the power over death. It's the power over the grave. When that stern old apostle come to the end of his road, and they dug his grave out there, and death was faced him in the face, he laughed right in the face of it. He said, Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Then he shouted the praises of God, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The mightiest conqueror that ever lived, the mightiest conqueror that ever died, for he was the only one who could conquer, die and conquer death itself and rise again in triumph. He proved what he was. It was the last seal of his Messiahship. Now, by chance, if there would be someone in this building this morning who's a lukewarm church member and don't know the joy of the battle being over, people shout, people rejoice, people weep. You say, what's the matter with them? They know it's a finished thing. It's all over. Sure, we're... Beating the bands. <laughs> We're screaming the trumpets. And the gospels are going out. The glory and power of God is known. And it's a finished work. Man. The treaty is signed. Praise glory God. to God. Christ signed it in His own blood. 
Amen. The battle's over. The victory's won. I ever won it. He won it. I'm just happy about it. Amen. <laughs> My, when some of those boys coming back from overseas, they tell me when a ship come into New York, just as it come into the harbor, they looked over there and they seen the Statue of Liberty is the first thing you see sticking up. They rolled some of them crippled veterans out on the deck of the ship so that they could see it. And when they began to see that Statue of Liberty, they began weeping. They cried. They couldn't help it. Great big man stood there, big rough-handed man, a quivered and shaken. They couldn't hold their emotions. Why? It was an emblem of freedom. Just behind that Statue of Liberty laid was Papa, Mama, loved one, sweetheart, wife, baby. All in this earth that meant dear to them stayed just behind them. And just before they walked in, they recognized it was the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. Sure would shake your emotions. That old flag flying. Think of it. A battle-scarred veteran coming into the harbor. Certainly, it was a wonderful time, but oh, brother, one of these mornings when the old ship of Zion blows, <laughs> and I see that emblem standing there. The old rugged cross. While the winds are whipping her old gray banners as she's moving through the fog of death. What a victory it is. Why do no wonder we can't hold our emotions still? Amen. Something has happened. We become fellow citizens. The thing is complete. When they spanned the great bridge between North uh, and, and, and South Australia, from Sydney over to South Sydney, how every man took while they went all over the country to try to find man to do it. That job was so great because they said no one would do it. Finally, a man from England said, I'll do the job. And when he got down there to do that job, he tested every bolt that went in the bridge. His reputation laid at stake. He tested all the mud and everything that went down. He got around in the best that he could find. He got the very best mechanics, the very best chemists, the very best of everything he could find around him. And finally, when the bridge was completed and the day come where she must be tested, the critics stood off to one side. And they said, it won't hold up. It'll shake down. That's too sandy down there. But he dug way, 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 way down. <laughs> he had confidence. He knew that everything was tested. And he said, I'll make the first trip across myself. And as he walked across the bridge in front of the mare, in behind like that, and the big trains about six abreast coming across, shaking that bridge, the great man who made it walk in front of the procession like this, if she falls, I'm with it. But he had confidence. That's the way our blessed Lord did. When he made his church, he tests every boat, everything that goes in it, for it must be blood washed. Amen. And while the critics are standing on the sides and that bunch of holy rollers, they won't make it but one of these glorious days. This great mighty conqueror walks ahead of us today. Amen. Triumph. Let her vibrate. Do what she wants. He'll, there won't be one slip in it nowhere. For he has made the way and completed it. Sure, we think today on the terms of the people. Get our minds up on things of the world. Let me tell you something, brother. Never have let me be ashamed of the gospel. Oh, brother, I'm just an old passion born again. Amen. Holy Ghost born of the Spirit of God. I was born that way. That's all I am and all I ever want to be. One time not long ago, there was a girl who had went off to college. And she was a lovely little girl. And when she returned home, she brought some of her college ideas with her. And maybe this morning some of you have some of your outside ideas with you. Maybe you've packed up the church a lot of your ideas. Well, get rid of them is the best thing I know to do. Then this girl, when the train stopped out front, she brought a little 
girl with her, one of those little snickle fritz time, you know, like the Elvis Presley time. And when she was standing there, you know, at the train, her mother was on the outside. An old woman standing there, all scarred up in her face, little stooped shoulders, little calico dress on, a little shawl over her shoulders. And this little snickle fritz that was with her, this other girl looked down and said, Well, who is that miserable, ugly looking old wretch? Well, you know, it embarrassed the girl so much. She said, I don't know. Because she was just so prissy and had so many whirly ideas in her head. And it was her own mother. When she got off the train, the little old mother ran over to throw her arms around. She said, oh, darling, God bless your little heart. And she turned her back and started walking away as if she didn't know her. She was embarrassed because her mother was so ugly. And it happened to be the conductor on that train knew the story. He walked around there and put his hands on that girl's shoulder and turned her around before that audience. He said, shame on you. Shame on you. He said, I've seen the time that when your mother was ten times as pretty as you are. He said, she was, I lived in the neighborhood. And said, you was a little baby. And you were upstairs in your crib. And your mother was hanging clothes in the backyard. And said, all of a sudden, the furnace caught fire and the entire house was in a blaze. And when your little mother ran along and knew that you were in the upstairs up there, said they screamed and tried to grab her, but she jerked what she had off and run through those blazes up in the upstairs and pulled her clothes from her body and wrapped you in it. And here she come back to the blazes, packing you and she fainted in the yard with you in her arms. And said she took what would have protected her and protected you. And said the reason you're pretty today, that's the reason she's ugly. And you mean to tell me you'd be ashamed of those scars on your mother? I think today if Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. If Jesus was considered Beelzebub by this world, he was laughed and scoffed at and hung on a cross and made a shame for me. I'm more than happy to bear the reproach of his holiness. Yes, sir, call holy roller, whatever you want to call, whatever remark you want to make, that doesn't stop it a bit. I'm only happy this morning that in my heart the resurrected Christ lives and reigns. I am one of his subjects. I trust that you are too. Our time is gone now. It's exactly 7 o'clock when we said we would dismiss. Further services will begin in about two hours now at 9.30. Let us bow our heads just a moment in prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, 45 minutes has passed. The Word has gone forth. Our hearts are happy. The Jubilee is on. Not just a jubilee for one day, but a jubilee for eternity. In glory the angels are singing. Oh God, the church triumph is singing. The joy bells are ringing. Souls that were once condemned to death and to die and go to the devil's grave. The devil has been conquered. Death has been conquered. The grave has been conquered. Sickness has been conquered. Superstition has been conquered. Malice has been conquered. Hatred has been conquered. Indifference has been conquered. Starchiness has been conquered. Self-styles has been conquered. Everything is conquered. Christ is the great conqueror. Lo, behold, the mighty conqueror, said the poet, Lo, behold him in plain view, for he is a mighty conqueror since he rent the veil in two. He rent that veil and hid man from God, and now God dwells among men. He rent that veil and kept off God's healing. He rent that veil and kept off God's blessing. He rent that veil and kept off God's joy. He rent that veil and kept off God's peace. Now the veils rent in two with his own blood. He walked as a conqueror. The battle is over. He's proven to us in his resurrection. 
And now the Holy Ghost is a witness sent to guide us. Oh, eternal God, if there be someone here this morning who's just dallied along the in and out from the highway, falling by the wayside, never been able to walk right out in the middle with the great heroes. The great heroes that trod the middle of the highway. We pray this morning that they will surrender their all to Thee and come out and enjoy this great victory that's been won by our risen Lord. Grant it, Father, for we ask it in Christ's name. And while we have our heads bowed, I wonder in this moment of time that if you would raise your hands to Christ and say, Christ, I appreciate I'll never be ashamed of you again. I've been just a little timid. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you, you. Oh, my, the hands going everywhere. I've been a little timid. I've been kind of ashamed. And I really see my position now. I oughtn't to have never done that. I should stand right out and give my testimony. I should be exactly that. I should tell everyone I'm born again. I should tell everyone I've received the Holy Ghost. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God and the salvation. I ought to be a real forward Christian. I haven't been, but by God's help from this Easter morning, I will be. I'll be. Someone else raise your hands now before we pray. God bless you. You, you. My look at the decisions, at least 25 or 30 sitting among this little group of people this morning has made a decision from this great triumph morning. They're going to, by God's grace, stand out and not be ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God and the salvation. Oh God, as these hands has gone up and the music is sweetly echoing back down the road as we have passed from death unto life for thou hast said he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life they passed from death unto life because you became death that they might become life through your resurrection you were made lower than the angels come down to be a man come out of that great theosophist from beyond and made flesh and had blood and shed that blood that you might make a way of escape for all of us. Then not only did it, we read it in the Bible, but you proved it infallibly by raising from the dead and raising the dead when you were here on earth. Not only that, but you, did, you made it a double proof as you did to Abraham. Now, besides that, you sent back the Holy Ghost as a witness and we have His blessed presence with us and in us, guiding us, leading us into all truth and life. We thank Thee for these many hands that went up this morning saying, I now take Christ as mine. Oh God, if they've never been baptized into the water to represent the great death, burial, and resurrection of their blessed Lord, may they come back to the service this morning bringing their clothes and ready to go down in this icy pool. Grant it, Father. Bless us, forgive us of our sins. We'll give thee the praise through the ages to come. When the battle is all over, when the smoke's all dried up and the joy is all finished of this earthly lips, where we praise thee with everything we've got, we'll have to have new voices, new beings to praise you by. May we enter in then with joy, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let us stand to our feet now. Don't forget the services. 9.30, go home, have your breakfast, come back. We expect to be with you now. And then tonight, remember, I've got to get away this afternoon, studying and praying. For I say unto you that Christ is alive. He is not dead. And I believe with all my heart He will be right in this building tonight to show that He's alive to do the same thing that He did on that first Easter morning and through His life's journey. If that isn't so, then I've been a false prophet. I'm so glad to know that in this great dark hour that we're now living, when all hope seemingly is gone, Christ, the solid rock we can stand.
All other grounds is sinking sands. All right, our little dismissing song of Take the Name of Jesus with you. Everyone together now. Take the name of Jesus. Somebody by way. Let's just praise Him. Let's just raise up your hands and say thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. All right, everybody. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me old. Thank you, Lord, for thing. Do you love him? Say amen. amen. Oh, that everything's completed now, children. Everything's over. There's no more battle. There's no more warfare. Nothing you got to do. It's already done. Amen. We just rejoice. Amen. Oh, my. We are complete in him.
or God took us, or someday we shall ascend out of the dust of the earth. For our Lord brought from the dust, went into the dust to give to us His immortal spirit. He ascended from the dust, and all those that are in Him shall ascend with Him someday to the regions of the blessed. As we have our heads bowed, I see Brother Smith is in our midst this morning, the pastor of the Church of God. Called on you last night, Brother Smith, but you just stepped out. I wonder now that if Brother Smith will dismiss us in a word of prayer. As you hurry then to your homes, have your breakfast, come back for the Sunday school service and the baptismal service immediately beginning at 9.30. Shall we bow our heads while Brother Smith dismisses us in prayer?